Ray Kurzweil, uh, you know, I, th I think almost any introduction um, uh, runs the risk of, um, of understating his uh, significance of this. He's basically been the inspiration for this whole, this whole event. Um, uh, the, as, as was already mentioned, his recent book, The Singularity is Near, um, uh, drives, this, uh, drives, this premise, um, drives this premise home that uh, we are in this world of exponentiating growth. Uh, there's a, Isaiah Berlin, um, the philosopher Isaiah Ber Berlin, distinguished between two types of um, intellectual thinkers. There were foxes who knew many little things, and there was the hedgehog who, knew, who knows one big thing. And I think of Kurzweil as a hedgehog who knows one big thing, and that is ex applying exponential math relentlessly and ruthlessly to technological innovation and change, and extrapolating uh, where, where that will go. Um, and that one big thing you know, has led him to work on many uh, interesting projects and many accomplishments. I'll just list a few of them here. Uh, um, he was um, described as the ultimate thinking machine by Forbes, uh, one of 16 revolutionaries who made America by PBS. Uh, he was the principal developer of the first CCD flatbed scanner, the first Omnifont OCR, the first print-to-speech reading machine for the blind, the first text-to-speech synthesizer, the first music synthesizer capable of uh, recreating the grand piano and other orchestral instruments, uh, the first commercial large vocabulary speech recognition system. Um, he has received 12 honorary doctorates, uh, the, the Lumbelson Prize, um, the world's largest for innovation, the National Medal of Technology, the Dixon Prize. He's been uh, inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame and uh, has honors from three uh, U.S. presidents. Um, without uh, too much further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Ray Kurzweil and get the event off to start. Thanks a lot. Well, th <clears throat> thanks for that warm welcome. Uh, thanks for all coming out. I can't actually see to the back of the room. Uh, and I'm looking forward to a spirited discussion of these events. And actually, speaking of how when AI solves a problem, uh, we then tend to put down the problem. It's not that important after all. AI has actually been defined as the set of problems that we haven't solved yet. As soon as we solve it, it loses its mystery. Intelligence has a mystery, so it's, if we know the solution of the problem. That can't really be intelligence. So it was very mysterious how a car could actually be driven by intelligence. Only humans could do that. And I was actually challenged recently at the Gilder Conference because I had predicted a car would do that. And uh, it was pointed out how pathetic all the DARPA cars were running off the road quickly. And uh, <clears throat> I said, well, you know, this it's surge of progress at the end. And uh, very soon you'll see this happen. And thanks to Sebastian and his team, uh, his car led uh, five cars that completed that course. Because now we say that, oh, well, that's not really intelligent after all. So, uh, and one by one, uh, I think there's no silver bullet. Uh, AI is getting stronger, and I'm going to make that point again uh, uh, this morning. I'd like to start by reading a passage from my book uh, and actually demonstrating a new product. The system is on. Camera is off. I'm ready. Camera is on. Field of view report. Top and right edges are visible. Six taking picture. This is a new product. Uh, it's a couple hundred blind guys and gals who are running around. Pre-processing picture. Reading the labels on their clothing, signs on the wall. Soup cans. Camera is three degrees clockwise relative to the page. Corrects for three different degrees of freedom of rotation and, and uh, tilt. Page one, GNR 289. The AI winter is long since over. We are well into the spring of narrow AI. Most of the examples above were research projects just 10 to 15 years ago. If all the AI systems in the world suddenly stopped functioning, our economic infrastructure would grind to a halt. Your bank would cease doing business. Most transportation would be crippled. Most communications would fail. This was not the case a decade ago. Of course, our AI systems are not smart enough yet to organize such a conspiracy. Strong AI 
If you understand something in only one way, then you don't really understand it at all. Speaking cancelled. So, that's uh... <laughs> Camera is off. An unsaved document and goodbye. <laughs> Uh, we developed this with the National Federation of the Blind. Uh, we did the research, and uh, actually an interesting point is we tried this five years ago, and we anticipated what the hardware would be like. So we took actually a large computer that was simulated what we felt would be available in a PDA five years hence, and, and that those, act, those uh, project, projections were accurate. A high-end camera that had, had four megapixels, and the hardware was there. The software was not. Uh, we really couldn't manage the, the requisite algorithms to handle the vagaries of real-world print taken from a digital camera, three different degrees of freedom of tilt and rotation, uneven illumination, curved images, and so on was not feasible five years ago. And it's one of many examples, and I'll, I'll mention a number of others, there are actually hundreds in my book, of how software and AI has progressed. People say, well, where are all these AI applications? Uh, it's a little bit like people who go into the rainforest and say, where are all these species that are supposed to be here? <laughs> when there's 50 species of ants within 50 feet of them, but they're deeply integrated into the uh, ecological infrastructure. And we have hundreds of examples of narrow AI deeply integrated into our economic infrastructure. Every time you send an email or connect a cell phone call, intelligent algorithms route the, the information. Intelligent algorithms design products, control just-in-time inventory, uh, assemble products, land airplanes, uh, guide intelligent weapon systems, make billions of dollars of uh, financial uh, transactions automatically uh, every day, and many other examples. And these were research projects when we met in 1999 at the Spiritual Machines Conference uh, that was mentioned. Uh, we are making progress. There's no silver bullet. Uh, but hardware and software are progressing at, a, at an exponential pace. In fact, seven years ago at this conference, it was said that, well, computers can't even tell the difference between a cat and a dog. And in fact, the pro progression in AI has been the opposite of the maturation of human intelligence. Uh, a little child will learn the difference between a cat and a dog. Uh, it's not until we're adults that we can do things like solve mathematical theorems. And uh, Carnegie Mellon's general problem solver in, in the 1950s solved mathematical theorems that Russell and White had, had been unable to solve, and so it was felt that it wouldn't be long before computers could do anything if they could do that. But in fact, the really challenging parts of human intelligence are the tasks that young children can do, particularly our pattern recognition. That's the strength of human intelligence. That's how Kasparov plays chess. He doesn't build this tree of billions of move, counter move positions. He was said, well, Deep Blue does 300 million board positions a second in terms of move, counter move sequences. How many can you do a second? He said one, maybe less. Uh, how is it that he holds a candle to machines? It's that uh, he, the power of pattern recognition. That is really the heart of human intelligence. Well, in fact, computers now can tell the difference between a cat and a dog. We're going to be adding a feature to this product so a blind person can snap a picture and it'll tell them there's a cat in front of you, there's a lamp to your left, uh, your ex-wife is over to the right, because uh, we are in fact adding face recognition. Uh, and why is it that we can tell the difference between a cat and a dog now with a computer that we couldn't do that seven years ago? Two things. Pattern recognition algorithms have gotten steadily more so uh, sophisticated. And we also have this tremendous data mining that we didn't have seven years ago. Uh, you need a lot of data to train these pattern recognition algorithms. So if you want a million pictures of, of cats and dogs, I mean, you know exactly where to get them. You, there are, in fact, three million pictures of dogs on Google. It's a nice game to try to guess how many pictures of different things are up there. Uh, there are more pictures of cats, 3.6 million. Uh, <laughs> and so you can train these algorithms. You'd be hard-pressed hard to find 1,000 pictures of cats and dogs seven years ago. And in fact, the National Federation of the Blind, which, with whom we worked with on this project, has two projects. This uh, pocket-sized reader, and their other project is a, a car that blind people can drive. And when, when that was announced four years ago, uh, that was considered ridiculous. It's not considered ridiculous anymore. We're not ready to turn the keys of cars over to, to blind people, but it's now seen to be a very reasonable project. And Sebastian, they're going to be in touch with you soon. Uh, because I gave them your name. <laughs> so, 
Underlying this is an exponential theory, the law of accelerating returns, which does say that information technology progresses exponentially. Uh, it's important to understand, first of all, this is specific to information technology, so people very often uh, pose, oh, here's some exponential trend, and that didn't progress exponentially. Exponential trends don't necessarily just keep on going. Uh, this is not relevant to things like population, which is not an information technology, and in fact, information technology thwarted it because the economic progress it made has been largely due to the, econo the economic uh, cost-effectiveness of information technology, and as, as soon as societies become wealthy, the population growth stops. But information technologies progress, but don't information technology, does, doesn't an exponential hit a wall like rabbits in Australia? Uh, that's true of information technologies. A specific paradigm will run out of steam and hit a wall, but then it leads to another paradigm, and I'm going to show you that a little bit later. Moore's law was not the first. It was the fifth paradigm to bring exponential growth to computing. Well, isn't there an ultimate limit to the ability of uh, information technology to uh, progress? And yes, I discuss that in detail in the book. There are limits to, based on what we know about physics, to the ability of information technology to progress, both in computation, communication, biological technologies, and so on. But the limits are not very limiting. One cubic inch of nanotube circuitry uh, would be millions of times more powerful than the amount of computation required to simulate all regions of the brain based on the most conservative estimates of that, uh, that amount of computation. And nanotubes are not speculative. Nanotube circuits are working. There's a, cell, a very large, dense nanotube circuit working uh, that has self-organizing features that's set to hit the market next year. So this is not speculative types of technology. But even if you were uh, skeptical about the ability of uh, molecular three-dimensional computing to be feasible, and I don't think that's actually a reasonable skepticism given recent progress of these circuits actually working, and uh, as I say, one set to, to hit the market, just conventional two-dimensional chips, according to the ITRS roadmap that has been followed quite rigorously for several decades, projects four nanometer features. We're now at 65, 50 is working, 35 is being developed. Four nanometer features are, are for 2018. Uh, that will provide, if you use application-specific integrated circuits, enough computation, 10 to the 16th calculations per second, to emulate all regions of the brain based on the most conservative estimates uh, for $1,000. So you don't need, even need molecular computing, although uh, that is quite feasible. This is a scientific theory. Uh, I actually got into this because I realized that projecting technology trends was key to being successful as an inventor, and I did that for that purpose. And I still do that uh, primarily for this reason. We started this project at the Reader five years ago because we projected it would be feasible in five years. I have a team now of 10 people that gathers data in different areas. Uh, and I've been developing this theory for 25 years. It's part of a broader theory of, uh, of uh, evolution. Uh, but Moore's Law, which the public is aware of, is really just one example of many uh, of this exponential progression. And people think intuitively in a linear manner. I think that's hardwired. We see what's in front of us. We project that linearly. One scientist was, was, I was debating with him the pace of progress in brain reverse engineering. And he was saying, well, it took me 18 months to model this one ion channel, and there's four other ion channels in this particular type of dendrite, so that's five times... 18, and then this other dendrite has six other ion channels, and he's adding all this up, and you know, 20 times 18 months, and it'll be a century before we finish this project. As if the computers we have to simulate these processes will stay the same, the pace of progress will be the same uh, for the next 100 years. Uh, we're, the reality is we're doubling the spatial resolution in 3D uh, volume of, of brain scanners every year. It's only recently that we can see inside the brain uh, with sufficient resolution to see individual interneural connections. And the same skepticism was expressed about the Genome Project. Uh, uh, when that project was started, we had only collected one ten thousandth of the genome. Halfway through the project, skeptics said, I told you this wasn't going to work. I mean, here you are seven and a half years into a 15-year project, and you finished 1% of the project. But you double 1% seven times, you get to 100%. That's exactly what happened. We exactly doubled every year the amount of genetic data we sequenced. It took us 15 years to sequence HIV. We sequenced SARS in 31 days. And there's many examples. If you can measure something in information, it inherently grows exponentially. But our intuition is linear. And so lots of people think intuitively 
and said, well, it's, you know, the kind of projections you get for an exponential trend just seem incredible, uh, but that is really how the technology in every different manifestation of information technology has progressed. The paradigm shift rates doubling every decade. Uh, the telephone took 50 years to be adopted. That was the first virtual reality technology. Before that, you, you really had to be in the same place to hold a conversation with somebody. Uh, cell phones did that in seven years. These are logarithmic graphs. A straight line on a logarithmic graph is exponential growth. Uh, these early communication technologies took decades to be adopted. Uh, more recent ones took a few years' time. And this acceleration has continued. I mean, the word blogs wasn't used three years ago. People didn't use search engines five or six years ago. Social networks are new. Three years ago, people said, you can't make money in Internet advertising. Now you've got uh, one company started here on this campus that's worth $100 billion. 99% uh, of its revenue comes from Internet advertising. So the pace of change is accelerating. And I don't really have time to dwell on this, but as I say, this is part of a theory of evolution. Evolution creates a capability and then uses that capability to advance the next stage, and that's why an evolutionary process accelerates. So the first paradigm shift on this double logarithmic graph took billions of years, but then evolution used DNA, an information uh, backbone, to guide the next stage. So the Cambrian explosion uh, went 100 times faster, and biological evolution kept accelerating. And the Homo sapiens took only a few hundred thousand years to evolve, and there's only three simple genetic changes comprising tens of thousands of bytes of information uh, that really distinguish us from other primates. Uh, a larger skull at the expense of a weaker jaw, so don't get into a biting contest with another primate. Uh, more of the cerebral cortex is devoted to the uh, cere most, more of the brain is devoted to the cerebral cortex, so we could do abstract reasoning. There are things like mirror neurons, particular neural structures that can deal with recursion, uh, which are also important in, in humans' ability to create hierarchical uh, symbolic structures. And the, the thumb actually works. A chimpanzee's hand, the thumb is an inch down. They don't have a power grip. They don't have fine motor coordination. They can't manipulate the environment. These tens of thousands of bytes of genetic information comprising these changes uh, is really the enabling factors that brought on the next evolutionary process, which was human-directed technological and cultural evolution. And that was a little bit faster. That only took tens of thousands of years for stone tool, fire the wheel. And then we always use the latest generation of technology to advance the next stage. And so uh, technological evolution also continued to accelerate. It comes out in a straight line, really, from the biological evolution that uh, preceded it. And uh, if you look at this on a linear graph, it looks like everything has just happened. Uh, <laughs> but people said, OK, Kurzweil only put points on this graph that fit on the straight line. So, I took 14 different lists, uh, Carl Sagan's Cosmic Calendar, the American Museum of Natural History, Encyclopedia Britannica. And these weren't lists trying to make or break my point. This, this is just what they thought the key events were. Uh, and you see there's some spreading the points, but there's a clear trend line. 